Yesterday, we got to talk about the massive benefits that the 3-3-5 defense could potentially bring to Stillwater, Oklahoma, but the 3-3-5 is only good if you have the right personnel. So the future and recruiting kind of matters. You are Locked On Oklahoma State, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma State Cowboys, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Howdy, y'all, and hello, all. Welcome back to Locked On Oklahoma State, your daily stop for all things cowboy and cowgirl related. My name is Cody Stovall. I want to thank you kindly for stopping by. To make this your first listen here on Locked On Oklahoma State, we are available on all of your podcasting platforms as well as YouTube. You can find me on Twitter at Aldeo State. Today, we're brought to you by Bird Dogs. Why? Because Bird Dogs is the bee's knees, and recruiting is important. As an Oklahoma State fan, we know good and daggling well the frustrations of recruiting. So let's talk about it a little bit with somebody who uh, has his nose to the grindstone on a daily basis, Mr. Brian Smith. How are you doing, my guy? Doing well, sir. Doing very well. Just uh, ready to talk some football recruiting. A little, little Oak State. Well, thank you very much. I do appreciate your time on this hump day. So yesterday on my show, we did discuss a little bit about how Gundy has his fascination, right, with the this new iteration of the 335. Not the 335 that was created by, by uh, Coach Dunn in New Mexico in 1984, right? Not, not the one that was even ramped up a little bit more at, you know, UNLV. But right now, the 335 that we have, it's not predicated upon a stack. It's more based on the 425 nickel, right? Your base nickel packages. And in order for it to work, you have to have the personnel to do it. If you do not have that linebacker, that Vaughn Miller style, right? That can roam a little bit everywhere. Yeah. If you don't have that guy, this defense does not work. And you saw it last year with TCU. You saw it years previously with uh, John Acock doing it over there at Iowa State. So this iteration that we have does fit because we have a Colin Oliver, right? It's because we were able to steal a five-star from Texas A&M and Kendall Daniels. When you have a six-foot-five, 230-pound safety who runs a 4-4, you're going to be okay. But <laughs> let's, let's just face the music. Oklahoma State fans have been up in arms about recruiting. It's been a problem for Oklahoma State forever and a day. You, know, you used to hear that well, it's hard to get people to steal our Oklahoma. Okay, that's a cool story. But people didn't line up to go to Tuscaloosa, Alabama before Nick Saban either. It, it, so some of the arguments I, I don't buy, right? I completely don't buy it. But if it was not for the transfer market, Oklahoma State would have been like number 70 in recruiting last year. And I don't care who you are. You're not winning a conference title damn near anywhere if you're recruiting in the 70s and 80s on a consistent basis. So you see it all the time, right? In, in your neck of the woods, you see people like UCF constantly trying to recruit against the Miamis and the Florida States of the world. We're doing the same thing. We have to compete with OU in Texas when it comes to the recruiting hotbed. But in your opinion, sir, you've been seeing it for a long time. What is the biggest key in recruiting now, as opposed to what it was before NIL and all this fun stuff? Once you get him on campus, you got to keep him. Okay. I, I look at it like 85 free agents. I know nobody wants to hear that. That is all about the logo of their school. Yeah. These kids are not picking schools by and large because of the school. It, if you didn't already know that, know it now. <laughs> it's, it's not. Um, I live in Florida where it's impossible to explain to somebody that lives here, let alone somebody that's in the state of Texas or Oklahoma, or Arkansas or something following the pokes. But kids here grow up fans of school X, whatever it may be, right. root for them their whole life, but then commit to the rival. Why? Because the only thing they really care about is what's my easiest path to the NFL. That's beginning and end of conversation. Yep. Now there are some kids that chase logos. And what I mean by that, if they think two or three have really good coaches, they're going to go to the school that's got the most swag. And that's where Oklahoma state has gotten slaughtered forever because it's not like Gundy can't coach. I mean, that dude knows offense backwards, forwards, et cetera, especially with receivers. Yeah. I mean, if a kid wants to go play at Oak State, okay, I get it. And then look at some of the running backs they've had. Guy yeah. gets 
five offers or whatever ends up being second team all big 12 as a junior or something. Yep. They know how to coach, but to win, especially at that upper echelon where you guys are trying to get consistently Oklahoma, Texas, it's about recruiting specifically on defense where it's 10 times more about talent than it is scheme and having guys that are versatile to run the three, three, five guys that can rush the passer on one play, line up in that same spot, make them think he's going to rush and then drop in the flat and pick it off. Raw talent, 100 out of 100 times is the deal. And that's where Oklahoma State struggles. My only my only thing there is they got to win still. It'll always be to a certain degree experience four- and five-year players, meaning guys redshirt go through the program. When Oklahoma State was really good a few years ago, went to the bowl game, beat Notre Dame, had a lot of experienced players that had gone through Jim Dole's defense. Correct. And they were fun to watch. They Correct. caused turnovers. They attacked the ball in the air. But that system wasn't very friendly to learn. It took a long time. It, were they good right away? Not really. Well, it, so they've got to keep the kids there. That's the key. And, you know, it's funny about that. Like, you see people freaking out in Columbus, Ohio, right? But I, I tell people, calm down. Let Jim Knowles do his thing. He's a quirky guy. He's got some oddities that you got to maneuver through. It's a very complicated scheme. But once you get it, it's absolutely insane what can what can be done with it. So, but you know what? Jim Knowles has something at Ohio State that he didn't have at Oklahoma State, which is the open envelope to recruit whoever he wants, however he wants, whenever he wants. So when you look at Oklahoma State's recruiting class last year, the saving grace for us is the transfer class, right? Up until National Signing Day on three sports at Oklahoma State as the number one transfer class in America, while still way back at number 80 for the high school class. But do you think that that's a recipe for success? Or do you think somebody eventually is going to fall and trip into a massive Vietnam level trap with all this? I'm going to fill everything with transfers and get 10 high school guys. Like eventually that's going to be a catastrophe, right? Well, it depends. Uh, here's a very ironic comparison. A certain person who probably can't step foot in your state anymore that used to be in Norman went that route at USC, but he also had Caleb Williams. Yeah. USC wasn't that good last year. That skill guys were good, but Caleb Williams was. I mean, yeah. it's just not even. It, it's not even possible to put it in perspective. He'd make three guys miss on one play when the O line was awful, and they get a twenty yard gain. He's the only player that can do that. They're doing terrible again this year recruiting, and it makes no sense. They're USC. That's on their staff, but they're doing well in the portal. At what point does it yeah. not blend well? And Caleb's going to play this year, and he's going to leave. Yeah, I want to see what they can do, and they're probably the better litmus test for your question. But, I mean, they still have – they got like Miller Moss coming up behind him. He's a good player, but he ain't nowhere near what Caleb Williams is. And any team that goes that route, that doesn't develop, you're going to face this same question no matter what uniform you wear. How good your chemistry going to be? you got kids coming from systems A through Z – all trying to get together in spring ball and over the summer to run a new school system, and you don't have Caleb Williams. Yeah. To me, that sounds like a disaster, just like you said. So I trust Gundy far more than about 98% of the coaches in college football, but it's still hard. That, In yeah. my opinion, they're, they're going to have to take a couple more JUCO kids, and they're going to have to keep a few more kids around juniors and seniors consistently through their classes, or they're going to be a middle-of-the-road Big 12 team. Because, like you said, seventieth, whatever, yeah. you're going to have moments where you just have a, you have a hole at a spot, especially if it's corner. That's always the worst to have it at because you can pick that spot over and over, and it develops into such a problem that your better players are overlooked because the other team can just pick on one spot over and over, and your really good guys are not a factor. That's actually a very, very interesting aspect that I I don't think I thought about it from that angle. See, look at you go, Brian. That's why you're the guy. That's why hey, Brian's the bee's knees, too. Speaking of the bee's knees, have you had the opportunity to hang out in your new bird dog's gear, brother? I haven't got it yet. So mm. I just got started, mm. so I haven't yet. But uh, I'm, I'm told that they are quite good. Yes, like legitimately, I don't want to save life changing, right? And, and it's all about <laughs> every everything's different for different people. Me personally, um, I have the benefit of getting to – lug a prosthetic leg around for the rest of my life. And so to me, comfort is at an all time absolute high. Like I invest a ridiculous amount of money 
in, you know, the breathable, pliable golf type of shorts. Not because I want to look good in a polo on a golf course because I can't play the game anyways, but because the comfort <laughs> side of things, it, it, it matters, right? The shorts sure. with the boxers insides are a breath of fresh air. You can swim in them, walk in them, work in them, fight in them, sleep in them. It literally doesn't matter what you do, and you look good doing it. And on top of it, right now, when you go to get your bird dogs, use promo code locked on, all one word. You get yourself hooked up with a bad mama jamma tumbler. And again, it's downstairs. This is three shows in a row. I've left the daggone tumbler downstairs. I'm failing in that department. I apologize to everybody, but it's a Yeti style. Um, Tumblr that you're going to absolutely love. So go to birddogs.com, locked on college, all one word. Get yourself hooked up some bird dogs today, baby. Okay. So you, you brought an interesting point up, which I think is a, a good segue into do you think that the high school recruiting is going to ever get even back out? Because as it sits right now, it's not just Oklahoma State, right? This is across the board. You saw it with two years ago, Mel Tucker at Michigan State, right? He made that magical run with like 72% transfers. So the, the evidence is out there that you can do it. But man, I'm telling you, you know, having conversations with high school coaches and doing some of these traveling seven on seven events, um, there's a lot of high school kids that are getting screwed here in this process. And my question is, does this ever get resolved? Right. Is there a happy medium that we come to or is the days of getting the high school film evaluated properly becoming less and less and less viable? I think it is, at least for the short term, because there's not any patience to win. And I've been told this by coaches. This is not Brian Smith's opinion. This is fact. I'm going to take the transfer portal kid because he's older, more mature, and he's also been off to college. There's no fixing that. When they went to the – everybody wanted it, so you got it. Yeah, yeah. The immediate transfer, this is what you got. High school kids became less necessary. There is no way around that. Until it goes back to a full-on, you have to sit out a year, everybody, and it's not going to, high school kids will not be as important. Beginning and end of conversation. That's it. There's no fixing that. No way around it. They're going to take the portal kid 99% of the time. The schools that don't. Georgia, Bama, Notre Dame, Ohio State, Michigan, you know, teams that finish in the top eight most years, well, that's because they can. They're yeah. taking kids that are good enough to come in and play as freshmen and sophomores that are probably going to get drafted. You know, what was it? Saban made a comment a year ago. He had like 68 guys in the NFL or something. It's just absurd. So, yeah. you know what I mean? It's different for them. Now, they still take a couple, you know what I mean? But it's not like Michigan State and Tucker, you know, they got the Walker kid out of Wake Forest and he went. Bunkers. He's starting for the Seahawks. Yep. He's unreal. They hit lightning in a bottle. What happened last year? Not anywhere nearly good. And I, I just watched their spring game yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Their, their their quarterback situation is yeah, they just walked into Auburn. They, they, he transferred to Auburn. You lose your starting quarterback to another school, especially one that was terrible. Not a good sign. The portal is a moment away from destroying your season, and college coaches have nothing they can do about it. So, yeah, I don't think there's a quick fix because the NCAA is going to have to lay the hammer on somebody and, you know, sanction them scholarships, the whole nine for recruiting off other staffs, but they don't have the kahunas to do it. That's well, my yeah. opinion. The, the NCAA, I mean, that could be, we could talk a, an hour just about them being an entity that may or may not end up being worth their weight in gold as time continues to progress. But dude, yeah, no, you're right. It It's very perplexing because the NCAA, they will punish and chastise some, the Oklahoma States of the world, the SMUs of the world, the UNLVs of the world. But for some crazy reason, they don't touch Kansas, Kentucky, Duke. Florida State, I know, buddy. It's oh, oh, it blows my ever loving mind. And every year, right, you see more of this recruiting getting getting shifted around. I mean, heck, look what Quinn Ewers did. Quinn Ewers went to get a bag of cash, knowing I would bet you money that Quinn no, Quinn Ewers knew good and daggone well he was not going to suit up and play games for Ohio State. I would, I would guess. I, w I would guess last year. He was getting a million dollars. I get it. I understand his rationale. I, I don't have any problem with that. But, I would yeah. guess last year even, there was a few guys on Texas A&M's roster that didn't give 13 craps if they ever played it down for Texas A&M. 
That's why they transferred. <laughs> so do you think that is going to end up being its own guidelines to eventually build some of the bowling alley bumpers built in here? Because the haves and have nots, it's getting bigger, right? The gap between 100%. the haves and ha it's getting bigger. It's getting more difficult. I mean, heck, you hear what's ha happening right now with Washington State. Like that has nothing to do with realignment. That's a financial issue. So if they financially are already in the hole before they start a season, how can they recruit successfully? How is that going to work? I can't. I can't. And so if no. Washington State's the first domino, that, that typically means there's more to fall. Because I can't remember the exact percentage, but I, I, I want to recall sometime I looked something up, and it said that only like 30-something, 40, maybe 40% 40 of college football programs are even profitable. On a consistent basis, I mean, my numbers uh, don't quote me. I'm, I'm, I might be off. That's why the the model with all this stuff with conferences and getting guaranteed money for a school like Minnesota or somebody like that, you know, Northwestern, Rutgers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Rutgers finally good in basketball, which they should have always been, but football they should have been good for a long time too, and they've stunk. They if they're not in the Big Ten, they're not making money. That's just well, reality. they've got a real coach now. Well, yeah, they had him last year too, and it didn't help them much. But we'll see. You never know. Yeah, yeah, but they they just can't recruit enough. So yeah, your point is your point is valid. Again, it's really simple. The NCA has to put in the bumpers, as you as you noted, and it's not going to be friendly to do it because a it admits they made a mistake in the first place. They're not good at admitting anything. Yeah, and b <laughs> that also means they're literally taking money out of their own pocket. They're really bad about that. So. Well, so um, my next question for you, so we'll, we'll circle back around a little bit to Oklahoma State here. Right now, right, what, you look at a multiple sources, we're currently anywhere from 27, 31st, 33rd, 35th, right? So let's just call a spade a spade. Let's just cut it down the middle. Oklahoma State is currently right around 30th in the country in recruiting. I think our average recruiting class over the last 12 years is like 34.7 or something like that. Do you think this is a potentially status quo season? Um, or do you think that it's still a numbers game and it's super early? Because we went from 24 to 27 to 31. So the longer time goes, the further our number gets away from 25. I would say that June will tell the tale. Okay. I'm not worried about that because everybody takes visits in June. They need to make some headway. Um, I'm not saying they're going to get anybody specific, but visits or visits, Gundy and his staff have to knock it out of the park. Th this is as straight line as it gets. They have to do a better job, especially, again, with defensive players, pass rushers, corners, et cetera. It doesn't matter if you're running Jim Knowles' defense or something else. On defense especially, it's about raw talent more than it is scheming them up. Uh, it's more about the Jimmys and Joes and the X's and the O's. That's something that Lee Corso talks about a lot. And he's right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. on offense, you can scheme it to death. And again, yeah. all the credit to Gundy, but he's never been a recruiter. It, they're not going to get over the top and get into the playoff and get a real seed. They might now when they go to 12, they might get, well, but they're not going to beat Georgia or anybody. They're not going to sniff that. They're not. They'll get annihilated. So they need to recruit better. There is no friendly there. It's straightforward. Now, since schools are on a less concerned about the brand, less concerned about what degrees a certain college offers, with all that kind of coming down the pipeline, I had I had a question for you that I thought was pretty intriguing that was raised to me last night that I was a little perplexed by, um, and I didn't exactly know the answer to. So that question is, do you think that some of these universities that are now pulling offers when a kid commits and then they go to the university of texas the next day right you're seeing more and more now schools are starting to pull that offer from that kid do you think that could potentially end up being some bumpers or could that end up hurting those universities if you're talking about like a kid's been offered and he doesn't have it anymore if that's what you're referring to that's been going on a long time the no, bigger you're it's more of um, a kid like th th this just happened to OU, right? So we were talking about it yesterday. Oh, you mean a kid on campus already? He, he came to campus, did the visit, you know, released his top three, and then he committed to OU, yeah. did the video, did the ceremony, all that fun jazz. And then he told OU he was done with the recruiting process. And then OU found out like two days later 
you know, he was on campus at Texas taking a visit, doing the tour, the whole nine yards. And so they pulled his offer. The reason I ask is because Mike Gundy mm. did the same thing two years ago. And there was article after article chastising him 17 ways from Sunday. And they were talking about how Oklahoma State's not great at recruiting. And Mike Gundy's now just making it worse by rescinding an offer. And who cares? Blah, blah, blah. Well, now OU's doing it. And it's okay. When OSU does it, it's a big deal. When OU does it, it's like, oh, well, yeah, the kid's not uh, honoring his commitment. I just, I'm not That's just media bias. That's just media bias. I'm not, yeah, and I'm not talking about the hypocrisy side of it, but I'm saying, do you think that this is now going to be the mold moving forward? Do you think more universities are going to start chastising (sighs) or punishing kids for basically, I mean, it is a lie. Let's just call a spade a spade. Kids these days do not understand what the word commitment means. You can, well, it's, applicable. it's applicable to marriage, right? Maybe people don't want to cross that bridge, but like 70 something percent of people are getting divorced nowadays. So kids see that on a daily basis. They're like, oh, well, if, if my mom's not committed, if my dad's not committed, if my uncle's not committed, if my cousin can quit his job whenever he wants, why do I have to honor my commitment? It's frustrating, but I think that a way to counterbalance it is by universities doing this. Do not tell me, you want to come to Oklahoma State. Do not tell me you don't want to take any more visits. Do not tell me you're in love with Oklahoma State and you're going to start recruiting on behalf of Oklahoma State and then go to Texas A&M the next day. Like, I get it. I get it. Well, I mean, that's in the state of Florida. It's a, it's a rule of thumb. A commitment doesn't mean anything. You're still taking four or five. So for me, it's no big deal. But I live in a state that's more unique than any other. Right. Um, the, the thing that I get, from some of the recruits and the high school coaches. And this is where it gets ugly. If you get a phone call and a radio network wants to hire you and you're going to make 50 K more, you're gone from locked on. You're gone. And that happens to coaches all the time, especially if they move up and they get a coordinator spot. That's a half million dollars more a year or whatever. He yeah. gone. Right. And that's what recruits tell me in, in flux. And look, there's no way around that. When Johnny recruits you to school X, and it's the coordinator that you basically went there for or that position coach, whatever, and they leave, that sucks. And the kids have been left out to dry for so long because for the longest time, the NCAA didn't have anything other than you got to sit out of here if you transfer. That really pissed people off. So now the shoe is kind of dropped on the other side. So there's, I don't think there's much of a fix for that. And especially when it's a top 100 kid, it's the one time the recruit holds the upper hand. Right. How many times can you call Nick Saban and say, look, I might come, but I'm going to visit Florida and I'm going to visit Ole Miss. You don't like it. That's fine. If it's a pass rusher, Nick's got to eat it. Now he's probably cussing when he gets off the phone, <laughs> but they're, you know, it's the one time they have power. So it's, it's a lose, lose. I, I don't see any fix in it really. Now, do you think a university is doing themselves a disservice if they themselves automatically write a kid off because they think the kid's going to be too high profile or the kid's going to be too much drama or the kid's going to be worth too much money? I mean, college is about development as as young people. I mean, there are kids that I knew that, quite frankly, shouldn't have graduated high school or even come close. They went off to school X. I mean, there's plenty of those stories are endless. And they go to college and it's just a lack of maturity more than anything else. And then right. the people that were or were not, if not both, around those young individuals. And then once they're out of that environment, oh, my gosh, they're OK with learning on and off the gridiron. So I think they're cutting it short. You're not buying into this prophecy of because he's a b- really good player. He's also really fit to leave home and he's mature. Please tell me that the people out there that follow the state, you know, Oh, the state fandom is not that stupid. I can't imagine they are because there's a lot of immaturity with these kids. They're 17, 18 years old. Some of them, I mean, I got coaches that tell me they worry about their phone drinking. Yeah. But if the player's the best player, it's just they, they're not going to win without him, but he's not ready for college. It's it's a bad mix. It's just the age. So I think it's still the responsibility of the schools, the institutions, with the mature adults, at least we hope. To teach some of these kids, and if a guy's not ready, you don't put him in front of the media. You don't you don't take him on the travel squad right away. You got to make him earn it sometimes too. So it, it's a combination. Um, I have a quick question for you. Um, and we talked a little bit off air, and you kind of posed this to me, so I'm gonna fire it back at you. In your opinion, just from you know bird's eye view, 
Does OU and Texas leaving the Big 12 help or hurt the Big 12, actually Oklahoma State specifically, in recruiting? It's... I think it kind of hurts from the rivalry standpoint, especially OU. You can dislike them all you want as Oak State. Without mm-hmm. that rivalry, I wouldn't see Oak State that much or know that much about them. Roger. Yeah, I mean, that, that that's that's potentially fair. And, you know, I think, honestly, it goes off success, right? That's just a common, common knowledge statement. Sure. But if OU goes to the SEC and they're constantly competing for sixth place, I, and, and, and Oklahoma State continues, you know, 10, 9, 11, 9, 7, 8, that, that type of, of trajectory that we've already been on as far as, you know, 10 win seasons, I could see us massively benefiting. And because the reason I think so is Lincoln Riley, he completely abandoned Oklahoma recruiting. I mean, that's how we got uh, Kendall Daniels. That's how we got Trace Ford. That's how we got uh, Deshaun Brown, right? A lot of these big time guys that we did end up getting, it was because Lincoln Riley didn't give 13 craps about recruiting Okies because Lincoln Riley knew he could get guys from California. He could get guys from New York and Florida, right? So he opened the door for us to cap and we've been able to capitalize. You know what I mean? Like recently just Malcolm Rodriguez. So he opened the door for us to, to get better recruiting when it ca- compares directly to OU, but you know, good and daggone well, Brett Venables is not going to be about that life. Brett Venables will no. want the top Okies, even though it's a small he'll, state. He'll do local. He'll do local. So yeah, I mean, I think if, if, if they go gangbusters in the SEC and they're competing for East titles on a yearly basis, I think it does hurt us. But if we continue our success and they falter a little bit, I think it hurt. It could help us. Right. So yeah, it's still to be determined. It, it is. Yeah, it's fair. It's contingent upon OU. And I'm also, ironically enough, I'm in the minority, brother. I actually think that it it behooves the Big 12 if OU and Texas look good in the SEC. I think if OU and Texas go to the SEC and they're automatically last place, what is everybody going to say? See, yeah, I told well, you. Look, the look at the, yeah, yeah, I, I 100% agree. 100% agree with you. You're right. So, and if OU and Texas are good, well, they haven't won the league. Neither one of them won the league for a few years now. So if they were, you know, competing for second, third place in the Big 12 and they're doing the same thing in the SEC, to me, it just adds viability to the Big 12. There you go. All right, man. We're, we're, we're approaching at the end here, but I'm not going to let you off super easy. I got one more rapid fire question for you. All right, what? I know that some of the ACC countries not a big fan of the prospect of UCF earning more money than them. My question is, do you think the ACC is still intact in the next three years? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Do you think the Pac-12 is still intact in three months? <laughs> I, that would be more likely no compared to the other one. It's the, the way the, the verbiage is in the ACC deal, and I'm sure – that's that's a lawyer deal, but they got them tight with the money. It's they they're do. gonna have to buy out. Like if they went, like if Clemson hypothetically went to the SEC, the SEC is gonna have to eat some money. And I'm talking like 30 mil a year. It's it's insane. Why they signed that, I have no idea. Well, that's, the bigger the biggest question whatever. to me is how in God's purple earth do they think they're gonna get out of it? Like that's what I mean. They they have to accept eating it for a while. Well, and or that's they have how to I can convince figure. they have to convince ESPN to pay yeah. more money that they clearly don't have because if ESPN had more ample money to throw around, we wouldn't be having this PAC 12 conversation. So the yeah, ACC wanting to have their grand rights discussion early, even if they get right, even if they get an eighth school and they meet that, that threshold requirement to get them potentially legality wise, at least into a conversation about getting out of the grand rights deal. My question is how do they think they're going to get more money by from e- ESPN? Like I, that's that's where I'm confused, and then you do see some people that are like, "Well, even if the ACC does break up, those eight schools will just start their own conference." And I'm like, "Okay, I've seen that thrown around. I understand that contractually that is viable, but the question still remains: How are you going to get ESPN to fork out more money they don't have?" <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I have no, no idea. It is what it is. Well, Brian, I greatly, greatly appreciate your time, sir. Um, next time I will be better about, um, uh, about, you know, dispersing some of the information a little bit earlier, but I greatly appreciate you coming on here and kind of jumping on an impromptu with me. 
and, and going over, um, uh, you know, some of the, the, the things that everybody in the country wants to know, not just Oklahoma State fans, everybody in the country, right? Everybody that has kids going through the recruiting process at the moment. This stuff is valuable and valuable to know. So I appreciate your time, sir. Let the fine people out here know how they can find your expertise work, my guy. Uh, you can find me at FB Scout underscore Florida. I am on YouTube. I am on Twitter all the time, and I'm on Instagram. I like to do a lot of different videos, breaking down recruits, talking about some of the leans, and I, I cover a lot of different kids because I live in Florida. So at FB Scout underscore Florida. Awesome. Brian, you're the man. I know you got a busy day, and, and, and you got a lot of people lined up that need your time, so I'm going to let you skedaddle on out of here. Thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it, and I cannot wait to have you on again, brother. All right, buddy. Thank you very much. Take care. Yes, sir. All right, y'all. Well, yesterday we talked about the 335. Today we got to have a recruiting analyst on to talk a little bit of the recruiting landscape. Tomorrow we'll hammer some more defense, and we will talk about some kids that exclusively fit precisely what we're doing. We made a top seven for a very big-time defensive end. He fits, and we'll talk about it tomorrow. All right, y'all.